our goal for today is to talk about other coordinate systems. Now you might be saying, other coordinate systems? Don't we have the Cartesian coordinates? Aren't they perfectly good? Well, the Cartesian coordinates are good, but we'll see in certain settings that some things are easier to work with when we change into other coordinate systems. Now, there's a very important idea to keep in mind. Namely, space is still space. So in other words, it doesn't matter what coordinate system we're using to describe our space, it's still the same underlying structure. Indeed, you don't have to have any coordinate system at all to work in space. Think about the ancient Greeks. They practically wrote the book on geometry, but they didn't use any coordinate system. Of course, we like using coordinates because it helps us do some algebra. And ah, algebra, our good friend. Well, let's start by looking in two dimensions. So our 2D coordinate systems that we have, there's really two of them. The Cartesian coordinate system is distance and distance. In other words, there's two distances involved. And we like to think of it as saying, how much do we move in two directions which are perpendicular to each other? One direction we call the x direction, the other direction we call the y direction. And with those two distances, we can locate anything that we want. Now, the other coordinate system that we oftentimes see in two dimensions is called polar. Now, you can think of it a little bit like radar. So if you've ever watched movies that have, say, for example, ships at sea, and uh, you might see that there's a little tiny monitor where there's this thing that wraps around and there's a little like beep, beep, beep. That little beep is indicating what? Well, it's indicating a direction that there's an object and a distance that there's an object. So the way that polar works is a combination of distance and direction. So we like to think of our distance, we call that R and theta is our direction, so it's an angle. So what we start is we start at the origin, we then pivot until we're going in the right direction, and then we move forward. All right, so that's the idea of polar coordinates. Now, again, it doesn't matter which coordinate system we have in two dimensions, we're still in two dimensions. So we can move back and forth. Now, the easiest way for us to figure out how to do that is to take these two coordinate systems and lay them on top of each other. So I have this one singular point. So here's this point, which we can describe as a combination of x and y, or as a combination of r and theta. Now, when we put this all together, we see, aha, we've got a triangle, but not just any triangle, the right kind of triangle. And so we have all sorts of wonderful things that you can do with right triangles. For instance, we have the Pythagorean theorem. x squared plus y squared is r squared. So that's a nice formula that lets us convert between x and y and r. We also can look at ratios. So we're involving theta. Cosine of theta, well, cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So x over r, or x is r cosine theta. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so sine of theta is y over r. y equals r sine theta. And we'll throw one more in. Tangent of theta is y over x. And there we go. Using these rules, we can now convert back and forth between the two coordinate systems as we want. Now, one thing we haven't addressed is why. Why would we want to do this? And it comes down to some very simple observation. And it's the following. And, uh, well, let's summarize. Uh, well, we'll say it out loud. Some things are easier to describe in other coordinate systems. So in other words, there are certain curves where it's easier to figure out what's happening in one coordinate system versus another. So let me give you an example. Suppose I, I were to write down the following. And I say, I'm interested in everything that has the following relationship. Namely, wherever x squared plus y squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus y, all that quantity squared. I'm interested in those points that satisfy that relationship. And what it, would it look like? 
Now, your response would be like, that's, I don't know. That's kind of crazy looking. It is kind of crazy looking. All right, well, let's uh, dig into it though. So here, what coordinate system are we talking about? We can actually figure it out because we see both x and y. And what can you do? Well, just do some quick conversions. x squared plus y squared, that goes to r squared. And then on this side, again, x squared plus y squared goes to r squared, y, well, that's our sine theta. And squared. Good. We'll take the square root. r equals r squared plus r sine theta. Okay. Divide by r. All right. 1 equals r plus sine theta. I should say there's a couple of details I'm sweeping under the rug here. But let's pretend like I can do that. So that everything we've done... Let's just say it's legal. Or if you rewrite this, you get r equals 1 minus sine theta. Now, if you were asked, which one do you think would be easier to figure out what's happening? I think it's easier to talk about something that looks like r equals 1 minus sine theta. It's a much simpler. There's not as much overhead involved. Now, you might still be wondering, well, what does r equal 1 minus sine theta look like? So I'm going to digress for a moment and tell you a story. So back in the day when I was a college student, which was a little bit of a, a long time ago, but I still went. It was good stuff. Uh, and Valentine's, the school newspaper, and they actually did print a newspaper back in the day. That's how long ago it was. They would have these little sort of love lines where you could write a message to your significant other. And so... I, I put out a couple of them to my girlfriend at the time. And one of them said the following. I, R equals 1 minus sine theta U. Now, why? Well, it turns out R equals 1 minus sine theta is what's known as the cardioid. And so if you plot it, it looks something vaguely like that. So that's another way of saying I love you with a little heart symbol inside of it. Now, in case you're wondering, I married that wonderful woman, and uh, we've been married now for about 15 years. So go ahead. You can use this on uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend, and you can say, hey, IR equals 1 minus sine theta to you. And, uh, well, let me know how it goes. Let me know how it goes. All right, so that's two dimensions. Let's take it up by one talk about three dimensions. And by the way, we're, we're going to stop at three dimensions. So that's good news. So we're not going to try to make you think four-dimensionally. So whew, <laughs> it's a little bit hard to do four-dimensional thinking. All right. So here we go. There, we're going to talk about all three of them simultaneously. So if we think about in two dimensions, we had the Cartesian, which was distance, distance. And we had polar, distance, direction. Now we're going to have three variations. So we'll start with Cartesian. Cartesian is distance, distance, distance. And what it is, is you have an x direction, a y direction, and a z direction. So how far do you go in x? That's a distance. How far do you go in y? That's a distance. How far do you go in z? Now, cylindrical is a system that actually, a nice way to think about cylindrical is you could call this polar coordinates plus z. And it, the way it works is it says, all right, if I want to figure out where I am, first thing is I say, where am I at inside of what we call the xy plane, if you like, the floor. And you can describe that location by a combination of r and theta. So it's the exact same r and theta we were talking about for polar coordinates. So we find where we're at on the floor. And then once we find our location, we move up or down by z. So there's going to be one direction, that's our angle theta, and then two distances, the r and z. So here we see theta come out r, come up z. And we should note, in case you're wondering about this picture, theta is doing the exact same thing as before. In other words, it's an angle off of the x-axis. So if you remember the way we think of axes, 
we have our x, y, and our z axes. So we take from our positive x axis, we move an angle theta, pivoting if you will, move forward by r, move up by z. So that's the way we get to our desired angle, excuse me, our desired location. Okay, now the last system is spherical. Now, how does spherical work? Well, it says, I really want to be the spirit of polar corners. Now, if you think about polar corners, the idea was, let me look in a certain direction and then move. Spherical says the exact same thing. It says, hey, let me look in a certain direction and then move. It's kind of if you've ever watched old episodes of Star Trek where they say, okay, what's our heading? Well, they'd give two numbers and they say, no, three, four, seven, mark, five, two. Okay, well, that two numbers you can think of as being angles. So it's turning, so you have the angle theta, and this is the nice thing about the coordinate system. Theta does the exact same thing that it did back in polar. So theta is turning this way, rotating, pivoting in the plane. Then you have another angle phi, which in some sense is sending you how far up to go. So we can pivot, and we can go up and down. And then once we've used the combination of them, now we have a direction and we go out a distance. And for that, well, we have rho. So it's this symbol right here. It looks a lot like a P, but it's the Greek letter of rho. And why rho? Well, because rho is the Greek for R. But we already have a number R that we're using in cylindrical coordinates. So we needed to use something else. So that's why we use rho. All right, now, theta works the same as before. Rho tells you how far to go. That's pretty straightforward, no big surprises. I want to take a moment to talk about this other angle which we're introducing now, which is called phi. And here's the important thing. Phi is just in the spherical coordinates. It's the angle off the positive z-axis. So we should take a little bit of time to understand what that means. Let's grab a piece of paper. All right. And so what do we have? Well, what we have is the following. So if I have my space, so I'm going to put my axes in here, not because I need the axes for space, but just sort of to orient ourselves. So what we can say is that phi equals zero is going straight up. So that's going straight up the positive z-axis. Then, as we increase, we can start to open up. So, if I come down a little bit, this would be at, say, v equal pi over 4. Now, notice that's a particular direction. Of course, we can go any direction. So what's going to happen here is, as we increase phi, we're really going to start forming a cone. So as as we increase phi, we're opening up, and then of course the theta, if there's no restriction, you can spin around. So you get a, a nice cone. When we hit pi over 2, well, what's happened? By the time we hit pi over 2, we're now at a right angle to the z-axis. And well, what's at a right angle to the z-axis? The answer is, it's the xy plane. So the xy plane corresponds to phi equals pi halves. And of course, then you can keep going. You push down below the xy plane. And uh, sure, you can do that. And finally, you can, if you push down far enough, what will happen is that when you hit pi, where will you be? Well, the answer is you'll be straight down. So this is phi equals pi. Now, you might want to say, well, wait, why do I stop there? Shouldn't I say I keep going because I, I, you know, zero pi halves pi? What would happen if I wrapped around? Well, the answer is you don't need to. See, look at what's happening here. See, if I'm coming down, if I come to a certain direction, you might say, okay, if I were to wrap around, notice this angle is still forming an angle of phi that it does over here. The only difference is that you've now sort of rotated this way. And that rotation 
is accomplished by looking at theta. So it's that combination of phi and theta that lets you achieve every possible direction in space. So phi only needs to go from 0 to pi. Theta actually only needs to go from 0 to 2 pi. All right, so there we go. There we go. Now, we have some pictures down at the bottom. So let's talk about what these are. The goal here is to sort of get some intuition about what do different coordinates correspond to. So for instance, over here, if I want to talk about x, y, and z, I can say, well, what if I just say x equals a number? Well, if I say x equals a number, that would correspond to something that looks like this. It's a plane that's perpendicular to the y, z plane. So this is x equals a number. Now, how about y equals a number? Well, if I talk about y equals a number, that's going to be another plane. But that's going to, in this case, be perpendicular to the x, z plane. How about z equals a number? Well, z equals a number will also be a plane. And you can probably guess what's going to happen there. It's the x, y plane that's just been shifted. So what you get is you get something of the form like z equals a constant. All right, so what do we have? Well, what we see is that the Cartesian coordinate system is fantastic for describing boxes or rectangles. So in essence, the Cartesian coordinate system is beautiful whenever you have lots of rectangles involved. Or if you want to say break things up into small rectangles, something we might want to do eventually. Okay, now let's go to our middle one. So our cylindrical coordinate system. We have three things, theta, r, and z. Let's do theta first. If I want to talk about theta, what that means is I've turned and then I have everything going out from that direction. So I can go up and down anything I want. I can go back and forth anything I want. I just have to be going in that direction. That's what theta tells us. So in terms of the picture, what it translates into is you will have something that looks vaguely like this. It's, you would call it a half plane. So, because it's not gonna go back all the way through, it's gonna start at the z-axis and just move forward because you we always assume r is greater than or equal to zero. So this is theta equals some fixed value. All right, well, what about z? z equals some fixed value. Well, the good news is whenever we have the same symbol in coordinate systems, it does the same thing. So in other words, the z in our cylindrical core, <laughs> excuse me, cylindrical coordinates does the exact same thing as z in our Cartesian, our rectangular coordinates. And so that's going to look like the xy plane has been moved up. So that's our z equals c. Finally, how about r? Well, what does r represent? r is how far we move forward. And if we think about that, it's how far we move from the origin. Now, if we were in polar coordinates and we said, well, r equals a number, what that would correspond to is a circle of radius, whatever our number we chose was, centered at the origin. Now, we're adding this third element, which is z, but if I still say r equals a number, it doesn't matter what my choice for z is. So if I'm down here at z equals zero, it's a circle. If I move up, it's still a circle. If I move way up, it's still a circle. Move down, it's still a circle. So what it becomes is a cylinder. Ah, see, that's a kind of a nice intuitive thing because we have this object called cylindrical coordinates. So it's nice to say, hey, the cylindrical coordinates have a reason why they're called cylindrical coordinates in that cylinders have a natural description. Well, I should say cylinders centered at the, uh, the origin have a natural description. Well, not the origin, the positive z, the positive z axis. If that's the center of your cylinder, beautiful description, beautiful description. So again, this is r equals some value. Well, let's call it d, working our way through the alphabet. All right which brings us to our last coordinate system, spherical. So 
Now let's talk about that. So in the spherical coordinate system, we still have theta. That does the same thing as before. So theta before was just this half, half plane. So it's still the same half plane. All right, so there's our theta equals alpha. Now, how about phi? Well, we talked about phi. What phi will be will become a cone. So it's everything that has an angle of phi with the positive z-axis. So there's what our phi equals some angle will look like. Last thing, how about rho? All right, so we need to think about rho and ask the question, well, what does rho represent? The answer is that rho is a distance. And in this case, rho is how far out we've moved from the origin. So if I say rho equals a value, that says I'm going to move out from the origin a fixed amount. But I'm not specifying a direction, so I'm going to move out from the origin that same amount in any direction. So what shape gets formed? And the answer is a sphere. So what we get is we get a nice sphere centered at the origin of radius rho. So this is rho equals some value. And there we go. So we say, aha, that's one of the reasons why we call it, by the way, the spherical coordinates, is that the spheres centered at the origin are so nice to describe. And it arises in a natural way when we think about what's going on with these coordinates. All right, so now we have these three coordinates. The Cartesian, or if you like rectangular, you might hear that referred to as the cylindrical and the spherical. But again, they're all describing the same space. Space doesn't change. Space is space. So we might want to say, well, how do I go from one coordinate system to another coordinate system? And for that, we need to understand our rules for conversion. And we do it in a similar way as we did for two dimensions, which is to say, let's just take this one point and we lay everything on top of each other and we ask ourselves the question, how do all these various things connect in? And once we understand that, then we have a set of rules that lets us jump back and forth between different coordinate systems. Now, some of these rules are going to feel really familiar. So let's start with the first three listed here. x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and r squared equals x squared plus y squared. We've talked about these before because these are the rules that we saw in polar coordinates. And they're the same rules. Nothing has changed. All right. Well, that's good to know. Now, the next one rho squared equals x squared plus y squared plus c squared. Where does that come from? Well, the answer is we can think about this point in Cartesian as being x, y, z. And we can say, well, how far is it from the origin? Well, according to the rules, it's the square root of x squared plus y squared plus c squared. That's the distance formula. But we also know that rho is telling us how far we are from the origin. Therefore, it must be the case that rho is equal to that square root of x squared plus y squared plus c squared. Or put more elegantly, rho squared equals x squared plus y squared plus c squared. Good. All right. Now, the next two are very useful, very important. And here we go. What are the next two? Well, they are z equals rho cosine phi and r equals rho sine phi. Now, where do those come from? Well, we see cosine and sine, so we think there's probably a triangle in there. And of course, not just any triangle, but a right kind. And there is. We just need to spot it. In this case, the triangle is the following triangle, where we take these three sides. Now, the claim is that this is a right triangle. Now, it may not look like a right triangle, but that's partly because of our perspective. You see how this part is going straight up and down relative to the xy plane. That tells us that this angle in the corner is a 90 degree angle, or pi halves if we're doing calculus. 
So that's how we know it's a right triangle. Now, the other question is, where is an angle? Well, now we have to think a little bit, because neither of these angles are explicitly marked. But let's think about what's true. Notice this corner. Well, we may not know what it is, but if we were to have, go all the way up to here, that would be pi halves. And then we say, well, we went too far, pull back by phi. So what ends up happening is that this corner is pi halves minus phi. Now, from here, you might say, okay, if I know I have pi halves in that corner, pi halves minus phi in that corner, that's two of my three corners, that's gonna force this last corner to also be an angle phi. All right, the reason is these angles are complementary. In other words, when they see each other, they're always like, ah, phi, you're looking fantastic today. How have you been? Well, wonderful pi halves minus phi. And you too look like you're having a great day. Ah, thank you, thank you. See, they're complementary. They complement each other. Good. Now we have our triangle, so we do our trick. So we can say, well, let's take our angle phi and let's talk about the cosine. Cosine is the adjacent over hypotenuse. Z over rho equals cosine phi, so Z equals rho cosine phi. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of phi is R over rho, or R equals rho sine phi. And there we go. Now, here's the last two. The last two look the most complicated, but in fact, these last two are redundant. You don't actually need them. Now, where do they come from? They're combining two facts that we already have. Notice this rho sine phi. Where else have we seen rho sine phi? Well, we don't have to look very hard. It's literally the right above it, right? Rho sine phi is r. So if you look, what does this say? x equals r cosine theta. Yeah, it does. And y equals r sine theta. So what it does is it, is it takes that rule for polar conversion and says, oh, by the way, if you need to go all the way into spherical, replace r by rho sine phi. And that's it. There you go. And that's how you can convert. So now, if you have any point and coordinate system, you know, maybe spherical, you can say, all right, let me convert it to cylindrical or to Cartesian or, you know, some other way. So, but these are all the rules. And collectively, with all this information, you can go from any system to any other system. Now, one last thing to talk about. We will see a lot of surfaces as we move forward. So it's good to be familiar with what surfaces look like. So let's start with the sphere. A sphere with radius tau. Well, we just needed some symbol that we aren't using somewhere else. So then at the origin, in our Cartesian coordinates, that's x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals tau squared. All right. In cylindrical coordinates, r squared plus c squared equals tau squared. A little bit simpler because we can combine the x and the y together. But now, in spherical coordinates, rho equals tau. Wow, easy, beautiful, simple. How about a cylinder of radius tau with the z-axis at the center? All right. Well, what that means is that it's going to run up and down with respect to z. So, x squared plus y squared equals tau squared. There's no z involved. It's just form a circle in the xy plane, and then it's going to automatically copy up and down. But in cylindrical, Mm, beautiful. Mwah. R equals tau. Perfect. Perfect. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, how did you get into spherical, this last one? Rho equals tau cosecant phi. Well, the trick here is you think about what is R. R is rho sine phi. So rho sine phi equals tau. And then if you divide by sine phi, you get row by itself. And oftentimes, when working with uh, there are spherical corners, we like to solve for row. So that's how we end up with cosecant. Cosecant is 1 over sine. How about 
an upward cone that has the very tip at zero, 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 and it forms an angle of pi force with the z-axis. Okay, well, all right, well, what is that? Well, with phi, that's really easy. That just says we're forming an angle of pi force with the z-axis. That means we opened up by pi force, and so phi is how much you open up. So in spherical, it's phi equals pi force. Now, in other coordinate systems, it's maybe not so obvious what's going on here. So how could we go from phi equals pi force to something else? So here's my suggestion. So when I'm oftentimes working in coordinate systems and I'm thinking about either spherical or cylindrical, I like to look at a slice. And so I like to think of this as sort of the, uh, what I call the RZ sort of slice going on. So in other words, if I have my three-dimensional shape, if I have rotational symmetry going on, about the z-axis. In other words, it's like I'm spinning about z in some way and the shape remains the same. Then I say to myself, well, let me think about what's happening when I slice in the following sense. So I'm going to start with my cone. So here's my cone. That forms a nice 45 degree angle. And now I'm just going to slice as I would where I was, if I was looking at a fixed value for theta. That's the idea. So I'm going to come along here. Oh, let me choose a better color to work with. And I'm going to go down the z-axis, and I'm going to go out in some direction. And what's going to happen is, because I'm really not paying attention to what choice for theta I pick, I'm not going to worry. So what are my two measurements that are really being made? They are going to be the following. Namely, I'm going to have r which tells me how far off I'm coming from the z-axis and then z, which is a z-axis. And I think about what a, a slice like this looks like. Now, what happens to this cone when I take a slice like this? The answer is that the cone becomes a line. Another way to think about it is if you were to start with this line and hold the z-axis fixed and spin, you'd get the cone back out. All right, well, now we can even say, hey, we were told that this is forming an angle of pi force. So we see, aha, now once we see it in this sort of half plane, we see how things relate to one another and we can understand what's going on. We can see this is a case where we have z equals r, right? Because z equals r is coming up. And we always assume that r is greater than or equal to zero. And now once you have z equals r, well, we know r squared equals x squared plus y squared. And then we say, okay, great. So r is the square root of x squared plus y squared, and we're done. And that's it. That's our the common surfaces. I really strongly recommend you get this notion of saying, look, if I have a three-dimensional shape and I have a hard time understanding about what it's doing, look at a slice, look at a cross-section. It's a really important idea. And we're going to see that, of course, there's better cross-sections than others. This sort of half-plane slice, where you're looking down the positive z-axis as the, sort of the, the half-plane, is a really great way to build intuition when you have that rotational symmetry around the z-axis. We'll see it again and again. So hopefully, uh, we're going to get great. Of course we will, because we're going to practice, which means we should go do some practice. All right, see you soon.